General Studies Paper 3. The first question is about the goods and service tax. So the question is enumerate the entire taxes which have been subsumed in the GST. Second part of the question also comment on the revenue implications of the GST. So here the question is very specific and in the first part they just want you to enumerate no need to explain, just enumerate the various indirect taxes which are under the GST. Similarly, next one is comment on the revenue implications. So, you have to specifically mention the revenue implications of the GST both on central and state governments and you have to comment on them. Comment in the sense you have to write your opinion on the revenue implications. You cannot just mention the implications but write your opinion on the implications. So, see, first in the introduction, as it is a 10 marks question, short answer, you have to keep introduction very short, maybe 3 to 4 lines. You just mention clearly what you want to tell about GST. So, the evaluator will know your knowledge on the GST. You can say that there are 17 different taxes, 17 different taxes, both by the central and state and the UD, unitary governments, which have been. Uh, subsumed under the GST mainly to remove the cascading effect mainly to remove the cascading effect that is tax on the tax effect so that everything can be consolidated into a single tax for easy monitoring and easy compliance for the uh, taxpayers so here the idea is one nation one market one tax you can also mention that GST is mainly a value added tax Right from raw material to the manufacturing to distribution, finally till the consumption. At every stage, the tax is imposed only on the value addition. So, if it is like 90 rupees here, 100 rupees here, the tax imposed is only for the 10 rupees. We just mentioned online. Then also, you can say that it is it is brought into India through 101st Constitution Amendment Act. See. You have to throw little facts here and there, though it is a question from economy, you can talk slightly online about the quality, about the various articles introduced in the constitution for GST. You can talk about 246A and 279A that are introduced for GST. Similarly, the 7th schedule, the 7th schedule of the constitution of India has been amended. So, after finishing the introduction of 3 to 4 lines briefly, come to the direct point that is enumerate the indirect taxes see here you have to mention in the state government the various taxes and at the central level central level the various taxes which have been put under the GST at the state government level the taxes like the state VAT value added tax then the sales tax then the entertainment tax but uh, not that which is imposed by the local body, but the state government's entertainment tax, then the entry tax, we can talk about the octroi tax, the purchase tax, the luxury tax, then taxes on this, uh, you know, this lottery, betting, gambling, etc. All these taxes which are previously under the state government are now bought under the GST. Similarly, the central taxes, we can talk about the excise duty and the customs duty. Excess duty, you can talk both about the central excess duty as well as the additional excess duty that means on the textiles or on the goods of special importance etc. And you can talk about the customs duty, the additional customs duty like the countervailing duty, the countervailing duty and the special additional duty and finally the service tax. See, you no need to mention all the 17 taxes. In the examination, definitely it is difficult for anybody to write all 17 taxes. If I mention some 8 or 9 taxes, it is definitely very good for the students who have given the mains examination. Then, now, after having mentioned these taxes, it is better if you mention one or two lines about various taxes that are still not under the GST. That means, you can mention about the state government's transaction income, property taxes and the petroleum, the tax on petroleum products, state excise, not the central excise which is under GST the state excise which is not under GST. You can talk about the 
electricity duty, etc. So here, if you give a straight one line mention about the various taxes not under GST, it will be a complete picture that well, all taxes are not under GST, still government has spared some taxes. So having said that, move on to the second part of the question. Comment on the revenue implications. In the revenue implications, you have to mention the implications of revenue on the center as well as implications on the state. As we know, most of the state governments are complaining about negative revenue implications that are they are able to get less money than before 2017 July. Similarly, at the central government level, talks have talk about the tax base whether increased or not, tax collection has increased or not, and also she's talking about the future scope. As GST is introduced only two years back, we may have to wait for a few more years for it to get stabilized. Similarly, at the revenue implications, you can mention both the positive implications as well as negative implications, and you have to comment. Comment the reason why the negative implications are there, and one or two lines you can mention how they can be countered uh, in future. So now coming to the revenue implications on the center, you can say the average monthly tax collection has increased as per the interim budget report 2019 20 as per the interim budget presented uh, the finance minister said that the monthly tax collection of government of india has increased from the previous 89000 crore to 97000 crore though we don't remember the numbers we can just mention that there is a considerable increase so this is a positive implication on central government similarly we can talk about the increase in the tax base mostly the indirect taxpayers in india have increased as per the 2017-18 economic survey as per the 2017-18 economic survey the overall tax base of the indirect taxpayers have increased by 50% this is a fact. There are around 34 lakh new businessmen who have come under the uh, tax net. You can actually comment. You can comment on the reason for that. You can say that registrations for the GST, the GST registrants, the GST registrants actually improved because of voluntary registrations, because of easy tax compliance, and also because to get the inputs, input tax credit, etc. That is the comment you are doing on the fact. Similarly, we can talk about the overall uh, collection that government has got in 2016-17, it's around 10 lakh crore, which is a good amount. Similarly, the growth of the uh, tax collection before 2017 or 2017 observe, the government says there is a 10% increase in the tax collection. So these are the various implications of revenue on the central government level. Now, looking at the state government, one thing you should observe is, the revenue of the state governments, even before 2017, was mostly from the indirect taxes. As you know, the direct taxes are always mostly collected by the central government. So, before 2017, the state's revenue is mostly based on the indirect taxation. However, GST has taken away most of the indirect taxes because of which states initially feared that they would be dependent mostly on the central government for the revenues and to some extent the fear has come to become true because in the GST as we have three pools like central GST, state GST and integrated GST, it's absurd. You can write that the collection falling under the central GST has increased well enough compared to the SGST and GST. In these two pools, there is no much growth in the tax collection. So, so to counter this revenue implication, the central government has provided a five-year support, a compensation for the state government. So, the five years is going to end in another three years. So, after that, what is the what is the condition for the uh, state government? That implication you have to mention. Similarly, government expected a minimum. 14% annual increase in the tax collection and government said that if this is not met the state should be compensated by a special cess by a special cess 
Hence, states are as of now safe. However, we have to see what happens after the three years. That is the future revenue implications, the scope of the three years. You have to mention that point. Then, you can also say that the homogenization of the commodity, uh, the tax of the commodity. For example, previously, the tax of different states, when it is in their hands, was completely different. Out of the GST, there is homogenization. Every state has to impose the same amount of tax on the commodity, on the goods or services. So, because of this homogenization, because of this homogenization, essentially what is happening is, the GST collection by the state GDP, the GSD, the state GDP, this has almost become standard. That means a state having more GDP is able to collect more GST and state having less GSDP is collecting less GST because of which this ratio has actually become kind of standardized. So in one way you can say one of the implications is that it has led to regional inequalities. Inter-state inequality industry inequality because states which are richer like Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat etc which has more GSDP they are collecting more GST and they become richer and the poorer states which are less GSDP are collecting less GST so this interest inequality has been increasing because of the GST is one implication which you can talk about also you can mention that when GST initially started the IGST the integrated GST, the government collects it and the government gives it mostly to the consumer states. Consumer states, but not the producer states. Not the producer states. For example, if UP is produced certain goods and if they are consumed by Maharashtrians, then what happens is the, in the IGST, what central government collects will be given to the consumer state, Maharashtra, but not the producer state. So we expect that the consumer states actually uh, get more amount of GST than produce state. But the truth is slightly different. The truth is that simply the state which is having more GST is getting more GST. So even that implication we have to mention. Also, you can say, see, the most implications which I have discussed here are the negative implications on the states. But you can talk about a positive implication also. Last year, previous year, Arun Jaitley has said that 20 state governments has reported at least 14% raise in their revenue because of GST so that you can mention the positive implication finally the conclusion after discussing all the revenue implications and commenting on them you come to uh, the conclusion there you can mention you can go beyond what is asked in the question you can say the fiscal federalism should be kept in the mind when the GST uh, is uh, being implemented so in the implementation if any changes are required they have to be taken care of also you can mention that not all revenue implications. The GST actually has made the ease of doing business better in India and also the efficiency of tax collection has increased and you can mention some other benefits of the GST to conclude your answer. So, any questions? Coming to the second question. Second question as such can be answered. However, how to address what exactly is asked is slightly difficult in this question. The question says, do you agree with the view that steady GDP growth and low inflation have left the Indian economy in a good shape? And also they are asking you to give reasons to support your answer. So here, here, first of all they are asking you whether to agree that a steady GDP growth has left the Indian economy in a good shape because sometimes the GDP growth may be good enough but the economy of India may not be reasonably good. Similarly, low inflation. Sometimes the inflation may be low but it may not lead to a good economy for India. So, they are asking whether you agree with it. And for these kind of questions, my suggestion is never say you agree and write only one side and never say you disagree and write only one side. It's always, to, it's always safe and better to say I partially agree with this statement. Because when you say I partially agree, you will have a scope of telling what are the things you agree and also you can mention what are the things you disagree. So in this answer, 
you start, for example, in the introduction, maybe introduction three to four lines, you write about something which is related to both GDP and low inflation. Maybe I would prefer the introduction of the monetary policy framework agreement. The monetary policy framework agreement signed between Reserve Bank of India and Government of India in February 2015. In this agreement, actually they mentioned that RBI has to try to keep the inflation below 6%. So, they have kept an inflation targeting, targeting of 4 plus or minus 2. So, it should always be less than 6%. But, with the care that GDP growth has to be maintained. So, based on that monetary policy agreement, which has to be actually maintained by RBA, we can say safely that in the last 3 to 4 years, India is largely able to maintain a steady GDP and a low inflation. Now, coming to the question, you can say, I partially agree. I partially agree with the statement given in the question. Now, you have to divide the answer into two parts here. One is steady GDP growth, other part is low inflation. See, you can discuss, initially you have to mention two to three lines to prove whether there is a steady GDP growth in India. You can say that in the last five years, the average GDP growth of India is around 7.8%. But you may caution that in the last quarter, I mean the first quarter of this financial year, the GDP growth of India actually fell down. We, we are seeing in the newspapers as the economic slowdown of India. However, in a larger picture, last five years, the GDP growth is steady, it is increasing at 7.8% on an average. So, this is proved. Similarly, because they said due the reasons. Similarly, low inflation. You can actually talk about the inflation, you know, before 2014, before the present government, the inflation in India used to be pretty high, due to which there are several protests from different sections of society. However, for example, 2018, if you see, the inflation rate is around 5.4%, 5.4%. And in 2019, in the last few months, that means it's calculated February month, respect to the last February, March, last of March. So, month on month, if you see, it is around 2%, 2 to 2.5%. So, actually in the last 5 years, the inflation of India is considerably low compared to the previous term. Previous term. So, you have proved this statement also. Now, now we have to talk about the good shape of the Indian economy. You can say that steady GDP growth, growth actually helped the Indian economy in few aspects. And you should also mention what are the areas in which the steady GDP growth could not help the economy, could not help the economy. We have to discuss both the points. For example, see, you can say the average income of the Indians has actually increased in the last few years. The average income increased. Because of this, because of this one, the standard of living of the Indians has improved, which is a good sign of the economy. Similarly, you can also mention that the stock markets, the stock markets showed more confidence in India and also the currency, currency indices, the currency indices have shown a good sign in the Indian economy. It is attributed to the good GDP growth of India. Similarly, the public spending of the government, you can write about the currency indices and public spending of India. See, public spending, in take, you can take a, a few sectors and discuss. For example, in the health sector, previously, the public spending was just above 1%, but now the government promised to in increase it to around 2.5%. Similarly, the public spending in the education, previously, is around 3%. Recently, it has increased to 3.7%, and government promised to increase it beyond 4% in the near future. So, this is also a good sign of the economy. Similarly, the FDI inflows into India, the FDI inflows into India have considerably
principal increased. For example, in the last uh, 12 months, it was around 40 billion US dollars. And this 40 billion US dollars is actually more than the China. So India is successfully able to attract the FDI. It can be attributed to STD GDP growth of India. Now coming to the things of the Indian economy which were not in a good shape. See, though the GDP growth of India is 7.8% steadily, the employment, the employment has actually increased only by 83%. We call this as jobless growth. In one of the UPSC mains previous papers, they asked the question about the jobless growth of, of India and business for it. So you can discuss here. Though there is steady GDP growth, there is a jobless growth in India. The employment is not proportionately increasing. This is the uh, first problem we can discuss. Similarly, you can say the borrowings, the borrowings of the government of India. See, the external borrowings of government of India actually increased by around 2.63%. You may not remember these figures, but you can simply say it has increased. See, the increase of borrowings itself is not uh, bad for economy. However, where are you using these borrowings? For example, if you are using these borrowings in the capital investment, capital investment, capital expenditure, the infrastructure, it's a good sign in the long term. However, if you are using these borrowings for the revenue expenditure, revenue expenditure, definitely it will lead to the savings of the economy. So, these aspects we can mention regarding the steady GDP growth. Now, coming to the low inflation, low inflation, you can say low inflation actually helped helped the Indian economy in certain aspects. For example, because of low inflation in the last two to three years, government is not forced to cut the taxes. Because of which government is able to collect good amount of taxes and we are able to maintain a healthy tax to GDP ratio. Actually, tax to GDP of India has, is almost 12%, which is a good number compared to all the previous years. Similarly, because of low inflation, government is not forced to give subsidies. Government, that's why, is not giving much subsidies in the last few years. Because of which, we are able to reach our physical deficit target. Physical deficit target. Actually, in the FRBM Act, the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act 2003, we have fixed a certain uh, target for the fiscal deficit, but unable to meet it mostly. For the first time, you can say almost for the first time, India is able to meet 3.4% of fiscal deficit target last year, which is a good for, which is you know a sign of Indian economy to be in the uh, good shape. Similarly, you can say that the basic savings and the investment of the economy has increased. The savings and investment. See, when the inflation is low, it automatically leads to more savings and better investment in the Indian economy. Now, see, similarly, there is one, maybe you can mention few uh, aspects of Indian economy which are not in a good shape because of low inflation. We can talk about the farmers. Farmers. See, because of low food inflation, as the prices of the food did not rise much, the farmers could not get good revenue. They could not earn much money, much, much income, which is a problem for the Indian economy. Thus, we have to discuss both, both sides of the Indian economy. That's why I ask you to mention, I partially agree. Only when you say, I partially agree with the statement, you will have a scope for discussing both sides of the coin. Now, for everything, you are actually giving reasons. See, in, in analysis of uh, most the economy, you have to mention the figures, facts sometimes. For example, this 2.5.4%, uh, 5%, 7.8%. 5%. That's why I suggest you to buy out certain facts from the budget or economic survey of one or two years and dump them in your answers to, you know, to uh, uh, get more marks in the economy answers. Now, finally, finally you can say in the last paragraph as a conclusion, you can say that in the last few months, there is an economic slowdown. Economic slowdown. As I told you, we have uh, the GDP growth of the last uh, quarter was only 5%. You can mention few reasons for the economic slowdown and you can mention solutions for it. For example, some of the science of economic slowdown is that 
automobiles at all has almost collapsed and the non-performing assets have actually increased and the non-banking non-banking financial companies also could not lend more because there was a liquidity crisis among the non-banking finance companies and you can also mention you know the conclusion of every answer should be more optimistic hopeful and we have to give some suggestions generally giving suggestions in the conclusion is a good way of writing an answer you can suggest that no skilling of the people leads to more employment you can suggest that the manufacturing sector should be focused much as it is more labor intensive and use more jobs similarly you can talk about the expenditure in the health public expenditure for health and education shall be increased for health it should be it should become 4% for education it should be 6% so, so that in the long term we can make use of the demographic dividend of the india on this note you can conclude the answer so any questions on this so now next coming to the third question of gs paper 3 how far is integrated farming system helpful in sustaining agriculture production? See here, notice how far. Then the integrated farming system helpful in sustaining the agriculture production. So in this answer essentially, you should initially start by discussing what is the integrated farming system. Then every part of the integrated farming system, you should explain how it helps in Sustaining the agricultural production. Sustaining means that practice, if followed, will be helpful for a long time. I mean, for example, see, in some practices like using excessive fertilizers, the soil gets degraded because of which you can no more use the land. Similarly, if you use excessive irrigation, the soil gets salinity so that in the long term you cannot use it. So, such kind of practices are unsustainable. Here, I'm asking you how this is sustainable and also. How far? How far means definitely this farming system, the system, cannot help in sustainable production throughout India. There are some challenges, some obstacles. So those things also you have to explain. Only when you explain the challenges, only then you can say you have answered the question completely. So also remember, see, mostly this answer can be done well with the geography optional students. Because they can even draw diagrams of the interior farm system. Generally, everybody writes almost similar points, but to distinguish your answer, get half mark or one mark more, you have to add some creativity, like you can draw a diagram or you can draw a good you know cyclic farming. How the waste from one resource goes into another resource. So let us look at each of them. In the introduction part, briefly discuss or define the IFS. You can say that. Integrated farming system is a method of farming where you use two or more agriculture practices. Like you can combine, you can combine poultry with agriculture with crops, or you can combine pisky culture, the cultivation of fish along with the crops, or agroforestry where silviculture. Silviculture means the cultivation of trees. Silviculture is done along with the crops. Sometimes you can integrate all of them even. So you can even draw a good diagram. Like you can take a agricultural field. You can say you, you go for intercropping. Intercrop means in this strip you can grow pulses. In this strip you can grow groundnuts. And here you may grow some other crop. And maybe here you can go for poultry. Poultry at one corner of your field, you can uh, poultry. Another corner, you can go for cattle ranching. Cattle ranching, animal husbandry, or piggery. You can go for piggery or duckery. And here, see, generally, open grazing of the cattle is leading to soil erosion and the elimination of the green pastures. Hence, you can go for the star feeding, star feeding of the cattle. See, silvery culture, cultivation of trees. You can grow trees within the field so that the trees give fodder. The trees give fodder for the cattle, fodder for the cattle. And the cow dung, the cow dung 
can be used as a fertilizer bio fertilizer for the agricultural field so the poultry the hens here can actually feed on the fish waste the waste coming from the fish or waste coming from the other places can be the poultry similarly it's because we call it as a cyclic farm cyclic farm so integrated farming actually helps you in cyclic farming where the waste from one resource can be used as a raw material for another similarly here uh, you are using the waste from the trees as fodder for the cattle etc now we have to explain how each of them helps in sustaining the agriculture production sustain see integrated farming is a very you know uh, it, it has a larger scope you know it has intercropping organic farming it has called you know animal ranching mushroom culture biscuit culture etc now how each of them helps in sustain egg this production firstly you can say that you can say that by the silviculture growing of trees the aquifers the aquifers will be recharged whenever there is a rainfall there will be more percolation infiltration of the rain into the ground hence the ground water gets recharged recharged similarly you can talk about abrasion of soil erosion soil erosion can be controlled can be checked by the integrated farming particularly the tree roots can hold the soil together then you know the uses of fertilizer and pesticide can be reduced the uses of uh, chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides can be reduced particularly because as you see it is kind of zero waste farming see zero waste does not mean there is no waste at all of course there will be waste but most of the waste can be used for another uh, sector sector so it actually helps you in best waste management waste management also see as you are using the cow dung as fertilizer or using some bio pesticide definitely the budget of the farmers in buying the chemical uh, fertilizer etc comes down the budget of the farmers comes down and when the budget comes down the farmer can sustain the aggregate production for longer time similarly as you use lesser chemicals definitely the soil will not get degraded and hence you can sustain the production of agriculture for a longer term similarly as the ground water is recharged you have to say there is better soil moisture and irrigation will be easier and farmers no need to look for the outside source of the water hence sustaining agriculture production will become easier similarly what yes watershed management yes you can say watershed management also actually watershed management is one of the practice uh, within the integrated farming system similarly you know there will be continuous income for the farmers there will be continuous income for the farmers as they are going for different crops and different kinds of agriculture there there will not be any seasonal income there will be income in every season for a farmer definitely this is a good business practice for the farmers also also the stubble burning which we are which most used in the north india after the harvesting this stubble burning will not be there in integrated farming because that stubble will be used for the next crop as a manure so there will not be stubble burning this definitely reduces the environmental pollution it saves the ecosystem the environmental pollution will be reduced it saves the ecosystem then there will be yes the nutrition security because as you are growing different kinds of crops as you know presently because of more consumption of only food grains like wheat and rice there is no nutrition security in india so as you grow pulses you know cattle poultry all these things there will be better nutrition security in india because of diversification of the agricultural practice that is also one of the very important thing also because of doing intercropping because of the intercropping what happens is see different crops different crops take the nutrients from different depths of the soil if you take this is soil pulses may take nutrients from this depth whereas groundnut may take from this depth so as they take from different depths they won't compete with each other for the nutrients 
Hence, algae production will become more sustainable. Like that, whatever point you talk about in the integrated farming system, you have to relate it and explain how it will sustain the agricultural production. So, there will be cyclic farming, reduce the budget, you know, soil remains fertile, you can talk about the agroforestry, talk about agroforestry, etc. Also, see, how far? How far can this happen? Here, you have to explain few points, at least three to four points, that integrated farming system has some challenges in India, like number one, lack of information. Lack of information or lack of awareness. Awareness. That means the extension services that are reaching the farmers are mostly not integrated with this integrated farming system. So, lack of extension services. Lack of extension services. Then, small land holdings. Most of the farmers in India are small farmers, marginal farmers, where they have small land holdings. Because of the small land holdings, it will become difficult to practice this kind of integrated farming system. Also, also, you may discuss how these problems can be solved. One or two lines you can discuss. Consolidation of the land or providing better extension services and you know, uh, using the technology, how to use technology, how to grow, how to you know, have horticulture within the uh, limited crop that they have. You can provide one or two solution. Of course, it is not asked in the question, but still you can provide one or two lines. Like that, you can address this. How far? This part can be addressed. And finally, after finishing the question, the conclusion part. In the conclusion, you can slightly go beyond the question. You can say that this integrated farming system actually helps not only in sustainable production, but also helps in the helps in the food security of India, food security, nutrient security, then water security, water security. Because here you don't need to use much for the irrigation, so water security. And uh, you know, you can talk about the income security, income security of the farmers as they get the income in all the seasons and uh, environment, the environment conservation, resource conservation, you can talk about the resource conservation. So with these points you can conclude the answer. Generally in any question, in any question, the first thing you will get marks for is whether you have addressed all parts of the question. This part, this part, and this part, all parts, whether you are able to address them. Then, whether you are providing any your own solutions, solutions, suggestions, something like that. Finally, in the conclusion, you may have to discuss something beyond the question, beyond the question, and some creativity, like using maybe some diagram, or maybe some people actually go for even flowcharts. Flowcharts, like what they do is, what they do is, they would say, you know, the crops, cattle, and the right, from the cattle, what comes is cow dung and trees. From trees, what goes is fodder, 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 and also trees act as the windbreakers for the crop, windbreakers. Windbreakers means during the uh, you know, storms. During the you know, uh, heavy winds and all, wind storms definitely can be reduced by the trees. So the effect of the crops will be lesser. Also, the leaves falling from the trees, the dry leaves, actually is kind of manure. It is it, it kind of biofertilizer. Biofertilizer. With that, you know, you can make a cycle. For example, you take the uh, pisciculture, pisciculture, paddy cultivation. How the waste from the fish is a kind of menu for the paddy and how the water provided for the paddy is helpful for the growth of the fish. So you can try a cycle like this. Means you can use some creativity to get some half mark, one mark more in this kind of question. Any doubts? Now, let us discuss the fourth question. Elaborate the impact of national watershed project in increasing the agri production in the water stressed areas. So here you have to elaborate the impact in increasing the agri production. See, as you know that Neeranchal National Water Project is presently running in India. Started 2016, it will be there till 2021. Here, when they ask to elaborate the impact, 
you are right both the positive impacts as well as any challenges for this project. So in this kind of questions as we are asking the government scheme we have to focus your answer mostly on the positive impacts what we have achieved in the agriculture production. Slightly you may write 3 to 4 points about the challenges still there exist in this scheme. And see if you want to discuss about this project you may have to finish it in first 3 to 4 lines. Don't spend much time explaining about the facts of this project. Your answer should be most likely 80% of the answer should be consisting of how it actually helped in increasing the agriculture production. So, in the introduction itself, in itself, just try to dump the facts that you know about this project. So, you can say the Niranchal National Watershed Project, which is planned from 2016 to 21 and implemented by the Ministry of Rural Development. Particularly in the nine states of India, these nine states are the water stressed states. For example, you can see the Gujarat and Maharashtra, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, Orissa and Andhra and Telangana. See, it's, it's, whenever it's, uh, you want to mention a few states, it's better to draw a map rather than writing all the states in two or three lines. It will give a better impact for the evaluation. Now, you can mention that uh, this project has the assistance from the World Bank. So, if you know any other facts of this uh, uh, scheme, just mention all those facts in the first two to three lines of your answer. So, having said this, See, if you, as you know that this scheme actually want to achieve the objectives of some other schemes like you know Pradhan Mantri, Krishi Sanchai Yojana, Har Ketko Pani and you know, more crop you know uh, per each drop. You know these kind of things instead of mentioning in the introduction you better keep it to the conclusion because you have directly come to the question asked that is its impact in the agricultural production. So after writing few facts if you have more facts, you keep them to the conclusion of the answer. Right now, start away directly with the positive impacts. The impacts, the positive impacts. See, you can say that this particular project of the government of India tried to reduce the surface runoff. Reduce the surface runoff so that soil erosion is reduced because of which the fertile layer of the soil the top part remain due to which there is an increase in the agricultural production in these nine states. I mean nine states in the sense only the rain fed rural areas like for example in Andhra Pradesh the Rayal Sima patch, Telangana most of Telangana patch and then you know in uh, uh, the Maharashtra, the Vidarbha, Marathwada, those dry parts and similarly the dry part of the Gujarat, Rajasthan. So in those areas as soil erosion is reduced, the fertile layer is stayed on the top because of which the agricultural production actually increased. Similarly, in the talk about the rainwater harvesting methods. Rainwater harvesting. Traditionally, Gujarat, Rajasthan, these states used to follow rainwater harvesting methods like you know jaris, bowlies, etc. And this scheme actually emphasized on them as well as developed some new techniques of harvesting the rainwater so that the excess water during the rainfall can be conserved and it can be used during the dry times. One of the one of them is actually check dams. Check dams in these areas help in increasing the infiltration and percolation of the water because of which the groundwater is recharged. The aquifers are replenished due to which the farmers can rely on their own land instead of any outside sources of irrigation for agriculture. Thus, it actually impacted positively in the agricultural yield, increase in agricultural yield. Similarly, this project helped in increasing the intensity of the cropping. 
So farmers in these areas are able to produce more crops per year as well as they are able to increase the yield per crop to do this project because of more soil moisture. Actually the soil moisture happened mainly because of regeneration of the natural vegetation. This project focuses on regeneration of the natural vegetation because of which the soil moisture increased that actually reduced the agricultural drought and increased the agricultural production. Similarly, this actually focuses on the scientific plan. The scientific plan. Like using the instrument technology, using the remote sensing techniques, the GIS techniques, because of using this technology, the yield of the crops in these areas have actually improved. Similarly, artificial forest construction. Not only check dams as we are harvesting, but also artificial forest construction, mostly in the low-lying areas of these places, following the natural drainage. Following the natural drainage, in the low-lying places, the artificial ponds has just improved the conservation of the water. See, one of the ideas of this point is that after 2021, they want the farmers to continue it on their own. So, when, when the point is withdrawn, it has to increase the sustainability of the agriculture in these areas. So, that actually has shown a good impact in these water stressed areas. However, after discussing these positive impacts, you have to spend, you know, maybe some one or two paragraphs discussing two to three points of the challenges of the scheme. See, one challenge you can say is that. These schemes will be successful only when there is a community participation. And here, the community participation in few states, in few states is lacking because of which the government is unable to use the traditional knowledge of the community and unable to work together. That is one of the things that has to be addressed. Similarly, this scheme is not output based. That means, as the scheme is progressing, they have to cons consistently, constantly take the feedback and based on the based on the constructive criticism, they have to modify the scheme and customize the scheme for each place. As all as in all the places, you cannot follow the similar methodology. And this output-based uh, progress is actually lacking in the scheme. This should also be addressed. So after mentioning few challenges, in the conclusion part, you can go slightly beyond the question. You can say that this scheme not only the crops but also it increases the animal husbandry because of availability of more water in these states the animal husbandry cattle ranching and dairy farming have actually improved that is one of the success of this project similarly as i told you in the beginning you can mention that the objectives of pradhan mantri Krishi Sincha Yojana in irrigation, capacity building, water management. Similarly, the objectives of more crop per drop. So, efficient water usage techniques and also Har Ketko Pani. Har Ketko Pani, the irrigation for all the fields. These, the previously existing three schemes are actually, you know, integrated within the scheme and this scheme is somewhat successful in achieving the object of these things because the scheme is able to coordinate and streamline the existing schemes into a in an integrated fashion. Also, you can say that this scheme helped in helped means it is trying to trying to do reduce the regional inequalities. As you know, these states are mostly water stressed and unable to develop at par when compared to other states. Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Orissa, these states. So this scheme actually helps in erasing the regional inequalities and also it helps in sustainable development. Sustainable development, I mean the rural development in such a way which can be continued forever. And also this helped in increasing the livelihood of the farmers because now they no need to depend upon the income of a single season. There will be year long generation of the income and forward linkages have actually improved because of the scheme. So, agro processing units have actually increased because of scheme. Finally, you can say that this is one of the you know uh, foundation for creating smart villages, smart villages as we envisage in the Niti Ayoks 
75 years strategy. So you can you know in the conclusion some four to five points like that you can discuss uh, uh, beyond the given question. Yes. So any questions? Looking at the fifth question, how was India benefited from the contribution of Sir Mokshagunda Vishwasharaya and M. S. Swaminathan in the fields of water engineering, agricultural science? See here we have to mention the contribution of Vishwasharaya and Swaminathan particularly in the fields of water engineering and agricultural science. And not only you should discuss about the contribution, but also mention how it benefited the India. So this is the important point here. See, most of us generally know about M.S. Swaminathan as in our syllabus of agriculture, we know about the Green Revolution and its contributions. However, about Mokshamuna Vishwasharaya, very few of us know the famous works that he has done. However, those students who have read the newspapers on 15th September on the engineer's day, definitely they would have read about certain contributions of Vishwasharaya. That is why it is better that you don't stop reading the newspaper even in the last few days of UPSC. As you know, this examination is on September 23rd and about Vishwasharaya it came on September 15th. So do not stop reading the newspaper even in the last 10 days of the examination. Now, in this, See, as you start this question, first in the regard of Vishweshwaraya, if you know any facts of Vishweshwaraya, try to tell all of them in the one or two lines, in two or three lines, and then move on to his contribution to the water engineering. For example, you can say that Sir Mokshagundam Vishweshwaraya is, you know, he was actually the Diwan of the Mysore state in the, in the British India. He was a famous civil engineer who has extensively worked on the irrigation works, you know, construction of dams and some other water works. He, you know, also he was Bharat Ratna. He was given Bharat Ratna by the government of India and also he was given knighthood by the British government. So after writing few facts like that, then we come to some of the major projects that he has done in the water engineering. So one of them is the construction of planning and construction of Krishna Raj Sagar Dam. See, this dam was built where Kaveri River and its tributaries are meeting. It was in the Mandya district, the, the, you know, the region of the Mysore. It was actually a gravity dam that was planned by Vishweshwaraya. See, after writing a few facts about the dam, you come to explain how it has been put in India. See, this Mandya district and the Mysore region was very dry and agriculture production was very less and farmers there were very poor and you know the poverty, hunger are predominant there in these areas. But after the construction of this dam, the reservoir actually highly helped in the irrigation of these areas and these areas actually became agriculturally very rich. Thus, he is able to eliminate the hunger and poverty in these areas because of this dam. Not only this dam, he has constructed, planned, even he was consulted by the British government for several other dams, most of which actually helped India in the drought times. It actually helped in the navigation, irrigation and domestic needs of the water, also in the controlling of the floods. Now, another major project of Vishweshwaraya was to make Hyderabad, Hyderabad as a flood proof city. See, Hyderabad mostly used to get floods from Musi and Isa rivers, Musi and Isa rivers and during that time around 1908-1909 when the flood was approaching Hyderabad, Mokshagunda Vishwasharaya was called upon to you know uh, reduce the impact of the floods on the city and he has designed a network within the city where the floodwaters of Musi and Isa could not actually come and flood the city as it, it has done previously. And the, even today, even today, the work which has at that time is helping Hyderabad to remain as a flood proof city. 
So even the present engineers can learn a lot from him. So thus it has benefited the India. Similarly, another major work of Mokshishashraya was floodgates, you know, the automatic floodgates. Automatic doors, you know, the weirs. Vishwashraya has actually designed and he has got a patent for automatic floodgates, automatic wheels. What happens is, when during the floods, the water level rises beyond the limit in the dam, previously they used to open the gates manually to let the water out. But after this invention, automatically the doors get open once the limit is reached. Now this was first tested and tried in 1903 in the reservoir in Pune. And it has given good results because of which later on it is implemented in the Mandya and the Mysore region also. Now, how it benefited India? See, because of this one, even if due to some reasons manually nobody is able to, able to open the gates, automatically they get open and they release the excess water because of which the dam would not collapse during the flood time and there would not be large scale destruction during the floods. The another major works of Vishweshraya that we remember is Vishakapatnam you know Vishakapatnam seaport Vishakapatnam port all the Vishakapatnam port the work of Vishweshraya actually helped in reducing the erosion and reducing the siltation of the beach even now many people call it as a civil engineering marvel which, which was done with, you know, in a low cost and in a very practical approach so these are some of the major water engineering works of Vishweshraya which benefited India. Now let us move on to the next part of the question Swaminathan. Well this part I am sure most of you would have written very good answer for this part. M. S. Swaminathan is called the father of green revolution and he has actually revolutionized the yield of the most of the food grains in India. In 1965, see till 1965, India used to import the food grains and because of the green revolution, particularly his work on the plant genetics of wheat and rice, both the varieties of Mexico for the wheat and variety of Philippines for the rice actually helped India. It benefited India in achieving self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency in the food drains. It actually helped in reducing the poverty, poverty and hunger among the Indians. And see, for the first time, because of this plant genetics, the high yield variety seeds, the high yield variety seeds are able to reach even the simplest of the farmers. Thus, one of its greatest contribution is taking the science to the masses, to the rural areas. Taking the science to the rural masses. Nowadays, most of the farmers are using high value seeds in a, you know, for a very low cost. Also, see, because of the green revolution, there were, as you know, some regional inequalities and it actually degraded the soil. It was not sustainable for the ecosystem or environment. Also, it has used more chemicals that has for health problems. That is why uh, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan has actually worked on evergreen revolution. Evergreen revolution. In evergreen revolution, he tried to take the agricultural, you know, the uh, high yield agriculture to the other parts of India, not only Punjab, Haryana or in western UP but also the eastern parts of India and in this African revolution he tried to focus on conserving the biodiversity and keeping in mind the ecosystem and environment and he tried to reduce the usage of the fertilizers for example methods like integrated nutrient and pest management sustainable farming has been encouraged and this actually benefited India in sustainable development, sustainable agriculture. Even the poor farmers can follow these methods. See, he actually focused on biotechnology in agriculture. Actually, initially it was only to the wheat and rice, 
but later on it has been extended to several other crops in India. So biotechnology nowadays has, has finding application in several crops of India which is increasing the yield. In fact, because we are able to reduce the import of the food grains, we are able to conserve, you know, save our forex. That's how it benefits India. We are able to save our forex. The forex exchange reserves. Also, Swaminathan is able to, you know, uh, show the government the importance of spending on research development in agriculture. One of the institutes like Ikri Satch, they actually, they work, R&D work in agriculture, is helping India, particularly in the dry land farming. So here, see, either Vishweshaya or uh, you know, Swaminathan, towards the conclusion, you can write something about you know, your opinion about them or how their contribution helped India in a very large scale. For example, you can say that both these great people are able to use the science for the benefit of society. So, using science for social development. Also, you can you know, use Article 51A, the fundamental duty. One of them is you know, developing the scientific temperament among all the Indians. And these two people, great people, actually contributed you know, in a rationalism and developing the scientific temperament among the Indians. On that note, on that note, we can actually conclude this answer. For you know, uh, and then you have any other doubts? Any questions on this one? See, the sixth question they asked about the space station. For this year mains, most of the students prepared very well about Chandrayaan 2, expecting that it is the major thing that happened in the space for India. So they are very strong in the Chandrayaan 2. However, as we know, UPSC generally avoids the questions on those topics which are widely covered in the newspapers. Because such a question can be asked by everybody who created the prelims examination. So this year, they asked about the space station. Then how did you UPSC ask about this question? If you see, after the Chandrayaan 2 was launched, ISRO chairman has come out for a press conference. There, he discussed about Chandrayaan 2 and also about various plans India has on the space program. There, he allowed to talk about our idea to study Venus, to study Mars once again, to study Sun by Aditya L1 project and our idea to send human beings into the space, you know, the human space program, Gaganyan. Similarly, talked about our plan about space station also. Like that, through the speech only, we understood that ISRO has a plan of, you know, uh, sending a space station into the orbit of the Earth. So, those who have followed the ISRO statement speech, definitely would have spent 2-3 to three minutes on doing some research about exactly what India wants to do with the space station, what are the benefits of it. At those points, would have definitely helped them in this year's mains examination. So, on this note, I want to give a suggestion to the students. Please focus on speeches given by important personalities. For example, on Republic Day, the speech by President of India. You have to go through entire speech and you have to do some research on various things he talked about. Every year in UPSC, both prelims as well as mains, there will be few questions from the President's speech. Similarly, the speech of Prime Minister of India on Independence Day, you have to go through it. The budget speech by Finance Minister, you have to go through it. Then, when major events like Chandra and two etc. happen, and if the chairman of the organization is through, gives a speech, you have to carefully go through it. Of course, the newspapers also, they mention about the speech. When you go through it, you have to do some research on it. Now, coming to this question. See, this question is very specific. It is asking only two things. One is, what is India's plan to have its own space station? First part. Second part is, how will it benefit the space program? So, you have to more discuss about these two aspects. Some of our students who wrote mains this year said that as soon as they saw the space program this part, immediately they wrote more points about you know, the Venus mission, the Mars mission, the Gaganyan, these things. But see, those things you have to limit to only two or three lines and most of your answer, major chunk of the answer should be consisting of these two parts. What is India's plan? What are the benefits? That's all. Now, in the introduction, in the introduction, it is better if you spend few lines and write about what is a space station and what is its importance or current scenario. See, space station is nothing but a large spacecraft. It is a spacecraft. 
know, the orbits around the earth. Okay, around the earth. It's like, you know, it's like a, you can say artificial satellite. And, see, the, the spacecraft orbits around the earth and generally we send the astronauts or cosmonauts into the spacecraft so that they view there, they view there and they can study about the you know behavior of human beings in the space they can conduct some experiments that's why space stations generally have science laboratories they have science laboratory to conduct experiments so also you can mention about the present scenario of the space stations at present in the space we have only one working space station that is international space station but you know but don't discuss much about it because it's not a part of the question just you can write maybe one line about the International Space Station. You can mention that India is not a part of the ISS or even China is not a part of the ISS. That's why China and India want to launch their own space stations. ISS actually have mostly, they have only five countries, five space agencies. The, you know, from United States, they have NASA is working on it. In Russia, Russia is also working on it. And the European Space Agency is a part of it. Similarly, Japan is a part of it. Also, Canada. Also, Canada is part of it. Only the space agencies of these five are working on ISS. So, that's why actually China has launched its own space station, Tiangong. Tiangong. Tiangong 2 was launched in uh, uh, 2016. It is deorbited in 2019. Actually, it's kind of experiment done by China to know whether they can, you know, work on the space station and hence based on success of this uh, tier 2 China is planning to launch another space station in next 3 years by 2022 so China is a serious uh, uh, contender in the space race uh, globally so after discussing about what a space station is and present scenario immediately move on to what is asked in the question because marks will be given only for what is asked in the question there won't be much more introduction may be carry half or one mark but mostly we have to address these two parts. So let us come to the first part. What is India's plan? See, India's plan is understood purely from the speech of Isro Chairman. He clearly revealed the plan of India. A few points which he has told in the, in the press conference uh, are one is we want to make very small, very small space station, space station, maybe 20 ton. A small space station. Actually, ISS is a very large space station, almost size of a football ground. Whereas Tiangong is very small, size of you know uh, a school bus, a school van. It's very small size. India wants to launch a very small space station of 20 ton. As you know, India actually is excellent in the space, particularly in making low budget you know space programs. For example, our Mars mission is the lowest budget, nobody ever expected. Similarly, if we can prove. Uh, that we can manufacture this one also for uh, you know, low cost. Definitely, it will increase India's standing in the international uh, space research. Then, our plan is to actually launch it, launch it in a low Earth orbit, low Earth orbit, some 400 kilometers from Earth. That's our plan. Then, our plan is actually to launch it within seven years after Gaganyaan. Seven years after Gaganyaan. Why? Why are we linking this with the Gaganyaan? We are linking it because, see, Gaganyaan is a human space lift program. We want to send three crew members, three astronauts from India into the space to understand whether we can do the turn launch. So, you know, definitely the extension of the Gaganyaan is a space station. Because space station is nothing but, we want to, you know, leave an artificial satellite, a spacecraft in the space and there we want to spend, send the astronauts cosmonauts who can do experiments. So actually a manned, a manned space mission only. So definitely through Gaganyaan, anyhow we are able to go for the manned space mission. So as an extension we are going for the space station. It's a natural extension. That is why they said 7 years, within 7 years after the Gaganyaan. So India's plan is by 2030 we want to launch the, you know, the uh, space station. Similarly, see, not only, not only they asked about the uh, plan, but also what are the benefits, what are the various benefits for the India's space program. See, there are several benefits. For example,
example, uh, first one is, one of the benefits is, our space program in the long term wants to generate revenue. We want to commercialize it. For example, as you know, because of GSLV, we are able to launch the satellites of many other countries. Our PSLV has launched satellites of several countries and earned a lot of revenue. Similarly, we want to commercialize commercialize the low earth orbit. We can generate a lot of revenue from the space station. Particularly because by 2024, by 2024, mostly ISS in the space station will be disbanded because of huge maintenance cost and you know, uh, crunch in the funding. So at that time, by the time we launch a space station, there won't be international space station. At that time, the competitor will be the China. China's Tiangong will be there in the space mostly. So, as we have, we have our own space station, we can invite countries to come and work there and we can actually commercialize it. That is one of the benefits to our space program. Similarly, see, right now, whatever ISS is doing, all those things can be done by our space mission. For example, ISS is right now working on manufacturing of vitamins, proteins, and you know, biotechnology, treatment for several diseases they are working on. All these things can be done by India, which will give more weightage to our space program. Similarly, see, disaster management. That through the space station, our scope for disaster management will improve and also, you know, monitoring the water quality will improve. Thus, it will benefit our space program. Also, also, Young minds, you can say, you can say many young people of India right now who have taken science as their field of interest can start working in the space technology because this will be kind of inspiration for the Indians and people who want to work on the space missions. Similarly, we can send our own astronauts and cosmonauts regularly into the space, regularly into space, and we can work on their safety. Means what are the various problems that astronaut gets in the space? We can study them. Based on that, we can design the further missions. For example, after the space station, we can design, we can implement further manned space missions, and they can become a global leader. We can become, you know, a global leader in the space missions, and we can win the space race. The space race. Also, it is useful for the international community. Not only for India, but also for international community. See, if you want to sustain the manned space missions, just by launching Gagan Yang, we cannot be successful. You know, we have to sustain that. For sustaining, this is a must. Like that, it will benefit the space program. So, after discussing some of the benefits of, space program, uh, of the space station, you have to spend some three or four lines discussing the challenges. In the question, they might not have asked, but you can mention towards the challenges for our uh, uh, space station and you conclude it giving some hope you know in, in a positive note the challenges which you can talk about is first one presently the you know the powerful rocket which we have is GSLV MK3 but this GSLV MK3 its payload capacity should still be increased if you want to achieve the human space mission so that is the first challenge for us second one is See, even if you have the space station, we should be able to dock, we should be able to dock the space station with the spacecrafts which are going there. For that docking infrastructure is of you know expensive. So uh, can we spend that much in our budget for the docking infrastructure? Second challenge you observe. Third is there should be enough space. There should be enough space for the cosmonauts to actually live there and work there comfortably. That also have to keep in mind. If these three challenges can be addressed, definitely our own space station can become a reality within the next uh, you know, 8 years or by 2030, can make it real. Finally, in the conclusion, as I always suggest you, in the conclusion last two to three lines, you live in an optimistic note. Maybe you can say that as of now India is doing very well in the space missions, maybe it may be studying of the Mars, studying of the Moon or Althea L1, uh, the work which you are doing to study the Sun or Gaganian, the space mission. We can also talk about the, you know, this um, uh, reusable uh, launch vehicle, technology demonstrator, which we have done few years back. We can talk about that. Similarly, one more feather in our cap will be the space station definitely will become as you know, the leader of the uh, space.
case in the international community. So, any other points?